Aloha and welcome back to the Creative Life from the American Creativity Association on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Gleese, and our co host today is Darlene Boyd. Today on the show, we will be discussing how to design innovative organizations with our guest, Neil Guterson. Neil is an entrepreneurial scientist who has spent over 35 years innovating how farming is done by creating new technologies in the agricultural industry. In the last seven of those years, he has worked with Corteva Inc. And there he has focused particularly on designing the way an organization is structured to optimize innovation. And we might find that very valuable in all of our own organizations and ways of life. You can send questions also by email to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. So welcome, Neil, and let me start with you. Hi, great to be here today. Great. What got you into being an entrepreneur in the farming industry? <laughs> well, um, unless you know, it's a, it's a long journey. And um, I started out in the, uh, the early 80s coming out of grad school. I was trained as a biochemist, molecular biologist. And um, it was the early days of biotech. I was pretty enamored of that uh, as a tool. And, um, you know, when I thought about uh, being an academic, I thought, you know, I want to do something much more applied and directly impactful. And with biotech starting, I, I went to uh, one of the early ag startups um, looking to use biotechnology to actually shift a bit, let's say, from chemistry to bio biological solutions for farmers. And so that was one of the earliest things I got involved with. But as I worked in that startup, um, it was advanced genetic sciences, I realized, you know, the opportunity to make an impact, um, you know, you really needed to, to look at both technology and business. I worked at that company for about 18 years, ended up leading the R&D organization, and then went to a, a new startup um, that was focused on, again, another generation of biotech in ag. Um, improving yields, improving stress tolerance, um, new tools for farmers. Um, was there for several years and actually was the CEO for seven years at a company called Mendel Biotech. And then I was attracted to and, and uh, got a position at uh, Pioneer Hybrid, uh, one of the, the uh, world's leading um, breeding organizations and seed companies. Uh, went there to lead a biotech group, lead the R&D organization, then the merger with Corteva happened. And in that time, as we formed one of the you know, top two or three um, ag organizations around the world serving farmers uh, very closely, um, I began to think a lot more about, as you noted, um, how do we structure an organization, a large organization, a complex organization, in a way to optimize our ability to deliver value today for the farmers in our standard business, let's say, but also work towards the future needs of those farmers and the future technologies that could help us deliver on those needs. So. Um, Pretty early on, started to see the importance of doing both the kind of innovation I did at the small company and, and, and large companies developing cycles of products. So, so you would say that if we were going to say on today's show, what's the problem yeah. that you faced and how did you solve it? Uh, you actually looked at the, at the organizational operations in the business that uh, needed to get they needed to get new products coming down the pipeline. They needed to get ready for their customers today um, that might be showing up down the line. And, and part of this solving this problem, I'm gonna throw out for the audience, the, the term ambidextrous innovation. Yep. And that's gonna be something you're gonna help us learn about today. And how does that help solve this problem of organizing a business for success and innovation? So what is Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about ambidextrous innovation and how we came to this. I mean, you know, um, there are two, let's just say, classic kinds of innovation you might think of for companies. Um, one of those is this sort of routine innovation that we do, might call it sustaining innovation. A company that's been around a while will have a business mo model, how they serve their customers, and a set of products. And every year they're making better products. And they know because the customers tell them, let's make this product a little better in this way. So that sort of delivery-based innovation is more the province, let's say, of incumbents in a particular industry with an existing business model that's working very well. At the same time, or, or the alternative really is about 
let's say transformational innovation. And I grew up in that world as startups, right? That's what entrepreneurs do. They look at what's happening in the world, try to change it, try to transform it, bring new technology and new business models um, into the marketplace. Now, an incumbent company, a big company, um, you know, should be doing work both for today, today's customers with today's products, but also anticipating the needs of their customers in the future. The customers are changing. The farmer is changing very much today compared to what it was five or 10 years ago. The demographics is gonna change in the next 10 or 15 years. Who is the customer? How do we serve them? How do we anticipate their needs? And so therefore, how do we do both? Today's customers with today's products, tomorrow's customers with tomorrow's products. Holding those two ideas, two ways of working, intention, that's the heart of ambidextrous innovation. And um, to make it work, uh, you need the idea, but you then need to think about how do we structure the organization internally to be able to do both well. And, and I believe absolutely, you know, with all conviction that the best companies in the world, the longest term lasting companies in the world will be those who can be ambidextrous innovators doing both, both today's innovation, sustaining and transformational innovation. Are these the same people or do you have side-by-side -side teams doing that? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we, uh, I think there are some people who like different kinds of, you know, sustaining innovation, right? Very clear path, very kind of fairly linear path. Um, maybe they're not so enamored of the uncertainty of a more transformational innovation. And there are some people who like, you know, they're more startup type people, startup companies, startup ideas. Mm -hmm. And so you definitely can find in a large organization, people who are attracted to each of those kinds of innovation. They work um, sort of in parallel, right? But they also share ideas. And the technologies that might be developed in the core innovation group might be leveraged over to sustaining the, the transformational innovation. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a good journey for people, right? To learn different ways of innovating. Um, one of the really important things is that you build independent um, and it's, it's because what often happens at a big company is you get a set of projects and what you find is that any individual project has a high probability of success. It's a small improvement. Um, it's going to generate value for the business. And instead of funding a project like that, you fund a higher risk or transformational project on the surface of it that project is worth less, right? And so you'll always favor the sustaining innovations. That's what big companies do. That's the, the innovator's dilemma as Clayton Christensen called it in, in essence. Mm. But if you have a portfolio of innovations that are high risk, some of those probably won't you know, get to the market. Others will be kind of neutral in the market, but some will be huge winners in the market. And so it's the portfolio of sustaining innovation and a portfolio of transformational innovation that really is at the heart of doing ambidextrous innovation. When you talk, Phyllis, if I may, when you talk about these teams, uh, might you be able to clarify, how do you determine the membership of the teams? Do, do individuals just emerge as being appropriate for the present and the future? Or, or can you tell just a little bit more about the, the membership? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And as I said earlier, some people have more of an affinity for one type or another. The level of uncertainty, the level of risk is different in the transformational side sometimes. Um, but part of it is, is identifying the right people within the organization who have that aptitude and then training them. Um, the way that we had done that at uh, Corteva was to treat the portfolio of transformational innovation more or less the way a venture firm would treat its portfolio of companies. Um, different ways of thinking about the marketplace. You don't necessarily evaluate a project's value based on a single you know, net present value of the future you know, sales of a product. Mm -hmm. For a venture, you look at what's the total market opportunity? What's the technology risk? What's the time to get to the market? So we train people to think differently. We train people to um, also to partner very closely. Oftentimes, sustaining innovations are mostly about technology. And so scientists are probably the prime drivers. But this transformational innovation is much more a partnership like a startup would be between you know, business thinkers, commercial thinkers, marketers, and technology innovators. And so we also try to find people who really want to work together and uh, scientists who learn more about the business and vice versa. So Neil, you have some show and tell for us today. 
we're starting, I think you did some of your most innovative work at Corteva. Mm -hmm. And do you have something to show us uh, that give us a sense of what this farm looks like that's getting this ambidextrous, innovative organizational leadership? Absolutely. Well, let me, let me, uh, let's start with one video. Um, there's a second that maybe helps tell the story too. But the first one, which we call Transforming the Farm, is about the disruptive innovation unit itself. And it was about some of the disruptive opportunities and ideas, but also about the people and the way they work. So let's have a look at that one. This little black box can turn our growers into scientists, bringing the science right into their field. We need to learn and understand as much about bees as possible. Farmers can have access to all the satellite data at a resolution which is second to none. For many people, change is uncomfortable. It's a scary word. But for these people, it's what they live for. Some of the most innovative ideas in the world today are happening right here in agriculture. Corteva has created a team of people dedicated to changing agriculture, and we want to not just experience it, we want to lead that disruption, disrupt ourselves, disrupt the industry. We have some brilliant scientists and technologists working on problems that farmers don't even know they have yet. We're designing the future of agriculture by deploying the latest technologies to the farm. We learn fast, we move fast. The really innovative stuff we're doing includes bee-friendly insecticides and robotics and artificial intelligence and alternative proteins and new satellite imaging tools. The accuracy and the speed and the resolution at which we get information from either satellites or a drone, it makes decision making extremely powerful. Fingerprinting our plants gives us the ability to understand what's hitched along for the ride, and often that's a disease. It saves money, it saves time, it saves resources. It's fun, you get a chance to innovate, you get a chance to create new things that has some sort of benefit down the road for either growers or consumers. It's a fun group of scientists to work with. We can win for farmers, we can win for the consumer, we can win for the planet. Agriculture can be much better than it is today and we're committed to delivering that. You took us into the future there, and of all from all places, from farming, uh, one of the old, the oldest industry in the world, uh, and it looked fingerprinting a plant. The lady walked in at the beginning with a black box. Did you do you send people that you train these scientists who are thinking innovatively? Do you outsource them to the farm, or do they do it? Are they doing their? Is that how this happens? Do you do you disrupt? Existing farms by planting your disruptors across, yeah, ac across the industry. You send them out into the field like bees. <laughs> well, Phyllis, it's a good point. You know that um, if you're going to understand farming, you better get out onto a farm, and you better talk to farmers and understand. You know what what's the pain point on the farm? What are the challenges that they really face? So that we're actually solving real problems that that farmers care about. So. You know, some people work on in the lab on you know lab stage of problems, but um, you know we did have this philosophy of sort of co-developing innovation with farmers, um, testing ideas directly on farmers' fields, and engaging them early on in a dialogue about you know not so much what they think. You know, it's, it's like the iPhone, right? No one thought about the iPhone. You couldn't say to someone, "What do you need from you?" You know, in the future, um, but you could understand what their problems were. And that's why Apple came up with an iPhone, right? It was a way of solving those problems. So yes, people go out on the field, they work in the labs. Um, and you know, agriculture, farming is sometimes a, one of the least sexy kind of uh, industries around. I think one of the reasons is that a farm looks a lot the same as it did 50 years ago, right? There's still plants in the field and they're growing. And you know, unlike you know, phones go from old and computers from old to very modern looking, it's sort of sexier to do that. But as you can tell from that video, hopefully everyone can, um, the, the level of information and technology being deployed on the farm to make farmers' lives better is extraordinary. Um, and, and to do that does require still this kind of innovation. Um, and you know, people who are doing more of this transformational innovation 
are learning from the experiences of, our, of the commercial market at Bea Corteva. They're learning from the experiences of their colleagues in the sustaining innovations, because they'll see some problems, right? Um, that can be picked up by uh, those folks working in the disruptive unit. And you got to feel for those people, right? These are just some of our um, you know, creative uh, scientists who have a little passion for uh, a different kind of challenge. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fun as well as uh, is important um, for, uh, for the farmers around the world. You know, if I may, I, maybe this is a good time to share the second video because I think it gives you another flavor on, as you'll see in this video, the importance of listening not just to the farmer, but to the consumer. And that's part of the theme of this disruptive way of thinking about farming, but also showcases a few more of the kinds of ideas and new concepts. So if we can go ahead and um, do the table to farm video, that would be great. We all know who runs a farm. The one who calls the shots, decides what to grow and how to grow it. But it's not just farmers. It's Sophia, that's right, Sophia, a new kind of consumer who's informed and empowered and knows exactly what she wants to eat and how she wants it grown. In addition to everything else that can make farming so unpredictable, weather, pests, volatile markets, and trade disruptions, farmers must now respond to changing consumer demands. The supply chain is flipping, and consumers like Sophia aren't at the end of it. They're at the beginning. We call it table to farm agriculture. It's the future of farming, and it's what we're working on right now. It starts with our seeds, bred to be as resilient and productive as the people who grow them. And new targeted breeding technologies like CRISPR that promise to help farmers adapt to demanding consumers and equally demanding conditions. With the right tools, farmers can do more than react to change. They can anticipate it. We're pioneering virtual farming to help farmers prototype new ways of growing before they even plant a seed. When we overlay different kinds of data, we're helping farmers make smarter, faster decisions across the farm. Environmental and historical data to know which seeds to plant where and when. Drone and satellite imagery to pinpoint where crop protection is needed. Weather data and artificial intelligence to generate higher yields with lower environmental impact. It's the dawn of a new agricultural revolution, driven by consumers and built on sustainability. At Corteva AgriScience, we're developing integrated whole farm solutions that are reinventing the world's oldest industry as one of the most modern. With Table to Farm Agriculture, farmers, Sophia, and our planet all win. And we all keep growing. Okay, I, I think a key word for me as I watched the video was uh, anticipate. And I think mm -hmm. when we go through a process of creative problem solving, uh, success often can be measured uh, upon the anticipation of what those problems are. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's vital. And, you know, what I think the commercial organizations and many companies often do is uh, understand what the problems people have and how, what features they want to see improved in their current product. The bigger challenge is to think about um, the nature of the problems that people face. And sometimes I know in some companies, they, they hire sociologists to go out and sit with their customers, right? And understand what, what the true problems are. Interesting. So, um, yeah, and, and farming is a, is a long horizon business. It takes a long time to develop the new products for farmers. So you want to look out 15, 20 years. What's the, what are the needs going to be? Let's, let's anticipate, as I said earlier, the demographic changes in farmers. I mean, give you an example. Um, you know, in North America today, the average farmer is probably 55 to 60 years old, um, still predominantly male. Um, we would expect in 15, 20 years, uh, the, the, the farmer to be much more gender diverse younger and much more tech savvy. So think about how we're all used to interacting with products and services on our computer, you know, getting ideas proposed to us by Amazon or others, right? Based on our buying habits. I think the farmer of the future is gonna to wanna to be served in some similar ways. That's how they're gonna grow up in this world, right? Being served differently than ever before. And so I think um, this does inform the kinds of innovations and 
and transformational um, business models that I think companies are exploring today. Um, so anticipation is a really key word. A great call out, Darlene. Thank you. Uh, am I am I correct to to assume that there still is a pattern of farming that's passed on from generation to generation? And I would suspect perhaps that there's a rigidity because of that, you know, and, and to change. What, what yeah, do you well, farming is definitely generational, right? And the, the best farmers really take care of their land, protect their land. Um, you know, their children maybe grow up on the farm, go off, come back. Um, I think you see a bit more of that perhaps even today. Um, mm -hmm. oh. But more importantly, you know, farming is a pretty conservative you know, operation, conservative business. Why? Because if you make one mistake, try some new technology and it backfires, you're a small company owner as a, as a farmer, your entire company can crater if you make a bad choice. <clears throat> the farmer, that, was, that was behind my question, that the pattern of creativity that the new generations coming in, perhaps they were more open. Yes, I think- I think have, problems appropriately. Yep, a growing generation of new tech savvy farmers who are open to trying things. I mean, to some extent, these are on computers, right? You, you can predict for a farmer what, what their farm might look like and how it might perform on a computer and share that with a grower. Um, you can offer them new services, right? Drones that spray chemicals and measure things on their farm. Um, and, and one of the key drivers, I think, also of the next generation is a passionate interest in sustainability, oh. in improving the environment in which we farm, in which we live. And so there's a lot of receptivity to farmers farming carbon, to sequestering carbon, to mitigating climate change. So uh, those are some of the, the features that actually lead to the need for ambidextrous innovation because there is so much change going on on the farm. Well, let, thank you. Let, let's take ourselves down the street now. And I understand now that you've left Corteva, you're yep. working on an international board that is catalyzing these ideas into other industries and then maybe even into the de developing countries uh, mm -hmm. in other ways. So you want to talk a little bit about that, Neil? Sure, sure. No, I, I I'd be delighted to do that. You know, um, these ideas of ambidextrous innovation, they're, um, they're, I think they're very broad and very important for, for many large organizations that have current businesses and future businesses. Um, customers are changing. And so, and you can see that, you know, some of the companies that we know best um, in, you know, whether it's a Google or an Apple or a, a Netflix and Amazon, these are companies that have done a great job of driving continual improvement in some of their, their business set segments, and then also innovating to create new and different business segments. When I went off um, and sort of retired at the end of last year, I had actually just joined the board of the CGIAR. It's an international organization whose, that, whose purpose is to serve smallholder farmers and low and middle income companies to help them become more profitable. Or organization, the CG for short, is going through its own transformation um, as an organization. It draws on a number of centers around the world, now getting organized as one integrated um, innovation organization. And what we've realized, these same principles apply here as well. Um, even though this is a non-for-profit, essentially serving smallholder farmers um, on behalf of governments around the world and other funders, um, there are some things that the group does that's fairly routine, the next generation of corn products or millet products you know, for the farmer or, or uh, you know, potatoes, whatever it might be, but also working on new ways of serving farmers, right? So there's a need for both system transformation at an organization like the CGIAR, serving smallholder farmers around the world. And there's a need for more routine, sustaining innovation. And so I'm you know, working with at the board level and with some of the management to think about, okay, what's the right approach to designing innovation in the CGIAR? Leveraging those same principles, knowing the answers may be a little different, but I think the principles of the need for different portfolios, different kinds of people, they're still very much germane. And I think that sort of <clears throat> approach to innovation will make the CGIAR you know, even more successful and effective in um, improving the livelihoods of smallholder farmers than it's ever been. It was a very exciting journey for me to bring that. It, it would. I, I wonder how someone prepares to position themselves to be on a farm as a data scientist or as an AI 
you know, our, our kids are going to school and they're learning all the computer science degrees and ways to use it. And they're thinking about high tech. How do you cultivate this generation that are going to become high tech savvy and then take it into the farm? That's not what they're thinking. How are you grooming these innovators? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I think farming and agriculture and food, it's kind of a calling. So some people are just drawn to it. Many people come off the farm originally and want to go back to um, your point about data is an important one, right? The, the farming world is awash in data, right? We can now have, we have satellites that can look down and resolution of a few meters and see what's happening on a farm. We have drones that can get resolution down to the you know, centimeter level and look at each plant in a field. And so I think um, the, the challenge of using information in really sophisticated way on the farm is attracting people who maybe wouldn't have been attracted 20 years ago to the farm and to farming as a practice and to innovating for farmers. I think we can offer farmers simplicity, convenience, uh, the ability to predict what's gonna happen on their farm and make much, much better decisions and, and do it in a more sustainable way. I think that combination of things is really attractive to actually uh, a growing group of younger scientists and innovators. And we see it in the small companies that are growing up in as well as in the larger companies. Does a does a farm need an, uh, a middleman like Corteva or your nonprofit to know how to attract and manage these? I mean, I wouldn't imagine that a generation third generation farmer would even know how to talk to and manage and 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 actually feed the needs of this kind of worker. Are they full time or are they contract? How do you bring this into your culture? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think farmers are more and more sophisticated, actually. So um, that's happening in, in real time. People are learning and becoming more savvy with technology. But um, I think it is important that because farming is so compli complicated, an individual, individual decision that looks appealing, right? You want to become more sustainable, but you don't want to lose money while you do a new practice. So I think, um, you know, AI, data tools, computational tools, it's really important that companies can invest in those on behalf of a large number of customers or farmers and then bring some of the best of that technology to farmers. Um, and farmers are engaging you know, regularly now, right? With small company innovators, large company innovators. Um, I think we talked about this as the co-design. It's a really powerful um, and important opportunity. Oh, thank you. And Darlene, I know you have questions and I see us down on the last minute of our time. My, thank, my thanks to, to, for the experience. I, I certainly will look at my salad differently this evening. And uh, <laughs> I think we've learned a lot. I do too. Brief session, quite a bit. Uh, so I, I think do. we'll leave it there. Uh, to the audience, you've been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, Darlene Boyd and I have been discussing ambidextrous innovation for the global food system and how to enable farmers around the world to be more sustainable and productive. And we've been learning all this from our guest, Neil Gutterson. Thanks for participating, Neil and Darlene, and thanks to all you viewers for tuning in. I'm Phyllis Bleese, and we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha.